Ronnie Pippen. Yeah.
Okay, hello, everybody. Welcome to this wonderful session with author artist Maya Gonzalez. It's for me difficult to pronounce Gonzalez because Gonzalez is my grandfather's second surname in Spanish, and I really have to make an effort to pronounce it like in English. So <laughs> sorry if I say Gonzalez. Right? Sorry. <laughs> um, well, I'm so excited to be here for various reasons. My name is Marina Bernardo Flores, and I come from the University of Barcelona in Spain. And it's a pleasure to be here back in Santa Barbara and here in this uh, amazing IRSCL Congress. And, and especially this session is special for me for uh, reasons that I will tell you when I finish presenting Maya Gonzalez. She is an award-winning children's book artist, author, activist, and progressive educator. Maya's work addresses systemic inequity in relation to race, ethnicity, sexism, and cissexism, uh, using children's books as radical agents of change and healing, both personally and culturally. Maya co-founded Reflection Press, a POC queer and trans-owned independent publishing house that uses holistic, nature-based, and anti-oppression frameworks in their books and materials for kids and grown-ups. Maya is also the creator of The Gender Wheel, a tool to express the dynamic, infinite, and inclusive reality of gender and provides lectures and workshops to educators, parents, and caregivers. And she's also the creator of this Congress logo. So thanks so much for that beautiful image which is accompanying us these days. To finish this introduction, I must say that I am especially thrilled, as I told you, to present and to listen to Maya Gonzalez. Since I am here, I can say uh, quite honestly that I'm here thanks to her work, which I analyzed uh, in my PhD dissertation. This is a great opportunity to continue the conversation uh, that we started a few year, uh, years ago in San Francisco in the Mission District when I uh, interviewed her and we had a wonderful conversation. So talking about circles and wheels, as you will see, I think being here today is a great way of not closing, I hope, but rather continuing the infinity possibilities of circles. So I am most grateful to the IRSCL Congress and especially to Sarah Penkinier well for inviting me to present Maya Gonzalez. Just um, some logistics, we'll have some questions at the end, questions, comments, and uh, that's all. So thank you very much, Maya, and we are all ears and eyes. <laughs> thank you, Marina. I'm extremely excited to be here, I have to say, and I will try to be good with the microphone. Um, so let's take a moment. This is about nature, right? This is about what has brought us here, the ecologies of childhood. So let's take a moment, and I always say this to folks when I, when I teach, when I talk, and feel that gravity holding you down to your seat. Feel what I call parent Earth's gravity pulling you here, to hold you here. This is them telling you that you belong here, that this is your right to be here, to be in this body, and to be part of all that is, right? So just take a moment, close your eyes if you need, if you want, and just feel that gravity. What is that gravity? It's the love of parent Earth reminding you that you belong. It's holding you here. So let's hold on to that gravity as we move through this talk. And I so appreciate you coming here today, thanks. All right, so, oh, there we go. I have so many things that I can talk about, and it was really challenging for me to like kind of get my mind all kind of pulled together. And what I realized is that I was supposed to talk about the scope of my work. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna like get it in here and package it into the scope of my work. So ironically, even though I think I'm really well known as an artist, I started off as a writer. And since I was 13, I decided if I go toward art, it's gonna take over my life, I have to write. <laughs> so I started writing and I actually entered university with the intent of being a writer. And I was in the graduate writing program and doing all this stuff, way too young, I think, to be in that program. And my own words uh, overwhelmed me. I was writing about the fact that I had been dis disowned by my family at 20 because of their homophobia. And my poetry was too intense for me to negotiate on the page. It was too pointed and sharp and real. And so thankfully, uh, somebody asked me to take a painting class. 
And I went back to what I thought was going to take over my life at 13, and it took over my life in my 20s. Thank goodness. Because what happened is I still had this very strong need to articulate, to negotiate what was happening in my life, to heal, literally, from racism, from homophobia, from classism, from multiple things that I was negotiating. And what happened is I took that all to the page in art. And through the nonverbal, I could find a way to meet myself, to find the healing aspects that I could basically pull back from my family that had abandoned me, right? And the three things that I walked away from that survive, that allowed me to survive that time without them, which then kind of also bonded me to them in a way, was nature, creativity, and spirit. And as I started painting more and more, those were the themes that kept coming up is how do I negotiate my belonging, right? That gravity telling me I belong here, this is where I'm supposed to be, this is love. And how do I find that from a place of isolation and abandonment, right? So a lot of my paintings um, are about that. And I'll look through them and I'll be like, oh. And death falls into that quite a bit for me as well. And so it's this interesting thing to go back and to kind of see myself documented through my own, my journey, through my own paintings. And what happened is I was like, oh, this is what I'm going to do. This is my thing. I moved to San Francisco from Oregon uh, to do that. And when I got here and I had my first show, I ended up um, bumping into somebody who created children's books. And they asked me if I wanted to illustrate a children's book. And of course, I was just like, well, yes. But what's interesting, is, as exciting as illustrating children's books was, I still thought of myself as an artist, right? I do children's books on the side. And uh, I, I, I th almost saw it as a great place where I could practice my skills. But what happened, I don't know that I expected this initially, was that I had approached all of my creativity all of my painting, all of my everything as a healing act, right? As something to heal me personally. So as I started entering into children's books, I was like, oh my God, I have so much to heal here. I have so much to face. And so it was all this mixture that started happening so that children's books became this conduit that brought me closer to myself in a way that I didn't expect. And it was because I was addressing the experiences I had had as a child in relationship to the kind of media and imagery I had seen. So back in the day when I started creating children's books, there were no children's books that looked like me. There were no round Chicanx faces, right, let alone queer, that were looking back. And so this was really oh, mind-boggling. It changed me. And so what I did is I entered into re relationship basically with the process, because that's what I do as an artist, right? And I started praying into my books and really bringing spirit in. Do you know how, you probably do, how difficult it is to bring spirit into the classroom with kids? And yet they are the epitome of spirit free, right? But it's almost like I couldn't talk about it. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to use my books to start bringing that spirit in so that we can have those conversations, so that we can feel that gravity, right, that belonging. So children's books um, would not leave me alone. I ended up doing seven, six, six with uh, Francisco Alacon, who Jorge just mentioned. Uh, and I did three with the Madre Irma Perez. And I was doing all these great children, really enjoying being an artist, not dealing with writing again at all, right? It was so nice to just enter into their words. And I worked with Children's Book Press, who would always partner me with people who were from my community. So as I created the art, I was feeling my own self within their story. Ironically, a lot of the people I worked with were queer not out, really, in the children's book community, specifically Amada, uh, not Amada, but um, uh, Gloria Ansel Dua, the first book I ever illustrated was by a queer Chicanx activist. And so this really like, had this impact on how I perceived reality in relation to children's books. Uh, and then, of course, at some point, there was some kind of situation that happened. And one of the editors that I loved came to me and was like, oh, we're in a total pickle. Maya, somebody backed out of a book, and I have this open schedule. I don't know what to do. Is there any chance you have anything you would be willing to put out? And I was like, ah, oh, child, I am waiting for this moment. I didn't even know. I had a book uh, called um, My Colors, My World. And so that began me actually going back to writing, where I was just like, oh, 
I can go back now that I found my space and my voice in a sense non-verbally, right? I needed that almost somatic physical embodiment to come through so that my voice had something to be held by so that it wasn't just like overwhelming me. It was like, oh, now I have the art to hold me so that my voice can rise again. So it didn't stop. And then it just kept coming, right? So I did um, My Colors, My World, which I have to say, people who know, um, it's actually a book about negotiating trauma, about coming back into somatic awareness with the colors and the experience of your world and literally charting them. And I say this to teachers a lot. These are books that you can use with your kids to bring them back when they start really having a hard time, right? To get that belonging and that centeredness again. Again, also with uh, I Know the River Loves Me was that same feeling of wanting to call kids in, grown-ups too, because I know y'all are reading these books to kids. That physical experience about being in the river, being experiencing nature in that really full way. These were very personal books for me. And then the third book, actually, Call Me Tree, I did for our kid. As I became a parent, I wanted a book that really called in this idea that we don't have to just use she and he, that we can actually use nature as a way to reflect ourselves and to find our strength and to have that more personal, intimate relationship. So I continue creating children's books. This one on the very end, I Can Be Me. Um, I'm really excited about, it's my most recent one, and it's this circular feeling to me because it was written by um, Leslie and Newman. So I started off with Glor Gloria Anzaldúa, this amazing queer Chicanx uh, radical, and then most lately I've done Leslie and Newman, who, uh, if you don't know, wrote the uh, iconic uh, Heather Has Two Mommies. And so it was this way where I felt like that queerness kind of came together for me in this more historical children's book traditional way. So I always joke that they accidentally taught me or let me into the children's book uh, industry because I learned everything I possibly could and started my own press. So I was just like, oh, this is how we make books. These are the people that don't get published generally. I'm going to publish myself. And so this is a press I started with my partner. And it's queer, trans, owned, POC. And we have a very distinct way that we approach what we publish uh, in terms of other people. Predominantly, we publish everything, all my teaching curriculums. Uh, we see a couple of those up here, and then my children's books. And then I mentor folks. And this is really kind of cool, because sitting over there is Isabel Milan, who uh, I got to play with, with Chabalita's Heart. And some of you may have met them this weekend. So it's been this blessing to have my own press, where I feel like I can respond to my community. We publish queer Chicanx, right, authors, artists. Um, and, and I mentor them in that same way that like, I understand that it, it changes us to create children's books. It's not just some book that's a toss off, toss off, right? These ones are different. These ones are really used as a tool to allow us to change first and then to use that as a tool to teach kids how they can teach uh, change and support educators so that they can also help kids with that, right? So it's always using children's books as a tool. I'll be perfectly honest with you, I've started painting again recently, but besides children's books, I don't paint, like literally the art, everything that I did for years is poured into the books now. Because I found through my personal experience that quite literally creating children's books is the most radical thing you can do. It's the most activist oriented thing you can do and it's the greatest change. If you want lasting, successful change, then you need to address kids. And to do that successfully, I feel is we need to have some place where we can meet, which is a book. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, so we'll take it a little deeper. So these are the books that I've created um, with my press, and my, our press, my partner's over there, the co-founder. You'll see him when we are selling books later. Uh, so for the last seven years, I have focused exclusively, practically, on gender and nature. I created the gender wheel, which we have here, and you can come play with later if you like, um, as a way to start talking to kids about infinity and our place within nature and how we can start making sense out of the world, right? So these are some of our books. Uh, we were the first ones to actually publish pronoun books. Uh, what's ironic is we were using pronouns as a way to start expanding ideas of gender. And what we see now so much in pronoun books for kids is that they're about defining and saying, oh, use this or do this or do this, where we're really about tearing all that apart and being like, hey, 
He could look like all of these different ways. She could look like all of these different ways. Like we're trying to take those boxes apart. Even they, like we want all of those things dismantled so that we can find true fluidity, true freedom and infinity within nature and within ourselves. So you can see here the gender will, and we'll be selling that later too, is the first children's book to actually talk about also the colonization that happens around gender and what's been laid over onto nature, right, and how that functions. So wanting to take that apart as much as possible. You can see up in the corner, we started, cre well, it all started because we have a kid, right? And when they hit about four, you're like, oh my goodness, we need a ton more materials that we're not seeing if I want to be able to parent effectively. So we created uh, pronoun cards. So these are based on the book, on my pronoun book, that green one up there. So those are the kids in there, and then we expanded it so that kids can literally engage. So we don't just want books, we actually want games, materials, playthings, more media. So it, it's seen as something that's very like accessible to kids. It's not something that's all rigid and defined and like it's about play, right? It's about bringing that spirit of play in. So you can see up in the corner this little video of us actually playing with some of the cards. So it'll be like the kids will be a whole bunch of different kinds of looking kids, all of color. I think we have one white children, one white child in there. So we're wanting to really broaden our perspective. And then you flip them over and just like, oh, a lot of times you'll notice that you'll have assumptions about what a kid should look like. And the cards will literally press into your assumptions and be like, oh yeah, that's not true. But it's done in a very playful way, right? So that we can meet kids in the act of breaking down our own assumptions and helping them not to firm assumptions into place, right? And then these cards are also mobile so that they can go be connected to other books. So we have all these reading protocols so that you can learn how to make any book accessible to any child in terms of gender, right? And that's really our goal is to break down a lot of these, I wanna say barriers, it's so funny. It's so difficult to talk about gender without nature, and I think that's so much what happens. So I'm gonna give you just a little tiny peek into the gender conversation, because we have some time. And then I'm actually gonna share with you a book I finished literally less than a week ago. These are actually photographs of the final art. The, uh, the actual art is in Berkeley getting scanned at the moment, and the book will be out later, uh, like a month, month and a half from now, two months from now which again is the power of having your own press. And we print within the United States. So we keep everything within this very simple, very immediate, very accessible framework. And what's always so funny is people are like, oh, you have a big press and da da da, it looks so good. I was like, oh, it's me and Matthew. It's like two of us. But like I said, I learned everything I could within the children's book industry. So my books that we publish look exactly like my books that get published by traditional presses. And that's what we wanted to show people, is like the press, the power is yours, is ours, right? We also used to teach people how to start your own press. So this is a way to keep, to take children's books to that more, I wanna say raw place, more to the hands of the people, to the hands of the artists, the activists, the community. So what this allows us to do is that when we start noticing something in our community, uh, we don't have it up on this one, do we? Oh, there it is. Um, when a bully is president. So this is not about 45, right? This is not about him. This is literally about the colonization that's happened that he's a part of. And so we're noticing that, right? And so this was a way we're just like, we got this book out in three months, two months? I mean, it was crazy. Like, he got elected, bam. We had, the, we're like, Matthew, he should never say this to me. He's like, oh, we should do a book about that. And I was like, mm. So we had it out in three months. We are just like, yes, this is what needs to happen. So that's the kind of power you can have with it, where you can respond immediately. So this next book that I'm gonna share actually is part of that response about being able to be very present with our community and, and respond to them. Um, anyway, what I wanna bring it, that's not what I was gonna say at all. What I was actually gonna focus on is you can kind of see that gender wheel right there. So the gender wheel, and I just wanna give you kind of like a, a overview before we go into the book I'm gonna share. So I'm actually gonna share you the photographs, the whole thing from my latest book. And because y'all are nature-y, I'm so excited and honored that this all kind of fell into place at the right time. I was like, oh, this is magic. And I don't think, I was saying to Marina, it's like I don't even think it's me or anything. I literally think it's the book. It's the power of books. And we keep hearing that. Jorge kept saying that. There's this magic 
in words, in, in stories, right? That's our power. That's what we want to share. So in the gender wheel, it's an, a whole approach. It's, I've been developing it for over 13 years, and it's highly, highly researched. It's incredibly like multidisciplinary. So I don't like research one thing and then not another. You have to research everything together, right? It's a nature-based, holistic, decolonized perspective on gender. So what that means is that we're going to look at, if you go into my trainings, right? I even have ones online. We're going to look at literally body diversity, gender diversity, might also be called behavior diversity in animals and relationship diversity in animals and find the patterns that are there. And what we find, what I found over so many years of research and doing this like big synthesis of these different elements is that there are these very distinct patterns that happen across literally all realms of nature. What does that mean? It happens in the plant realm. It happens in all of the animal realms. I'm talking bugs, snakes, reptiles. What are those are the same? Every mammals, fish, birds. All living beings have patterns of diversity that are similar, including humans, right? So this is our way of being like, okay, we're not going to project onto nature. We're going to receive nature. We're going to witness nature and understand ourselves through that concept. And when we do that, what we find is that these patterns, they tell the most beautiful. It's so nuanced. And... The complexity, I can't even go into how everything's interconnected and that everything is one and that infinite diversity is quite literally nature's secret power, right? That fluidity is what keeps everything moving for so long. And so how do we find ourselves within that? And the gender wheel allows us to do that, right? Okay, so that's our little precursor. So this is the new book, A Gender and Infinity Book for Kids. So the imagery could be a little bit sharper. These were photographs taken in our living room, but let's play. We are infinity. This is who we are. This is who we have always been. Infinity is everything growing, everything flowing. And you'll notice there's actually things that you can point out and study that will be listed in the back. Everything glowing and showing and knowing. Everyone, everywhere, inside and outside, is a part of infinity going. When you were born, all y'all I'm looking at right now, you became a part of all this. Can you feel it? Then... There are the boxes. You feel that? <laughs> that shift? <laughs> and again, this is that place where art can really convey. This is why I had so many years of nonverbal time, right? To use the art to really get us to have that feeling. People have been taught there are two boxes, and everyone must fit into one or the other. It begins even before a person is born. People ask, are you having a boy or a girl? Why do they want to know? They want to know because the box isn't just about the body a person is born with. It is also about how that body is expected to look, act, and feel inside, even how that person is treated. The boxes are based on old, small ideas and not on nature's infinity. Here's a doll for my pretty princess and a truck for my little man. I can't count the times I've heard this kind of thing on the playground. Because of these ideas, we teach kids to fit into one of the boxes as they grow up. We do this in a million little ways. How we dress kids, what toys we give them, how we talk to kids, even how we play with them, right? When kids are taught to fit into one box, it can be difficult to see infinity. The boxes become everything. And everything, including our self, can get very, very small and tight to fit inside the box. But even when infinity has been pushed inside the box, it's always there, ready to burst out. Learning to be and see infinity, no, see and be, be and see, 
frees us from the boxes, right? So it's that return to seeing ourselves reflected in the complexity, the nuance, the beauty, the interconnectedness of nature. Then everyone and everything can flow and grow in their own best way. This is who we are. This is who we will always be, infinity. Okay. <laughs> Infinity's very happy. <laughs> so I actually, yeah, shall we do questions now? I want to, I, I kind of wanted to leave a little bit of extra space for questions um, because to be perfectly honest, if y'all don't have any, I have tons and I have tons of answers. So, um, so let's play. <laughs> do we do the microphone? And I'm open to answering questions about my gender curriculum uh, and approach, obviously, as well. Hi, thank you. Um, I really love the vibrancy of the colors in your illustrations. Oh, good. And I'm just curious <laughs> if that came first and then it translated into children's books or is it a result because you are illustrating for children and do you have other art that maybe has a different color scheme I mean wow a blue period or a charcoal wow. and ink period You're good. are you an artist I would like to be but I don't know so you are well everyone's an artist if you take my con anyway um, so that's a really 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 interesting question so like the the ones I was showing at the beginning I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do a thing. <laughs> oh, there. So, so, I started off with um, color became that way to communicate, right? It became so potent and so rich. And when I first was, I was in school and actually I um, took that art class and then I did a little bit of art and then I lost my funding. So then I was just spit out into the real world. And I was just like, oh man, what do you do out here? And I was really, really poor. And I would, I could only buy my art materials from the dime store. And so I made a point of it. I'm like, okay, I'm only gonna buy my art materials from the dime store and see how far I can push my colors. And so I kind of trained myself in a way to take any materials, and, and dime store art materials are great for sure, but they're, they're something that's not as clean, not as pure, like if you buy something from the art store, you're going to get like ew, crazy pure stuff and you just lay it down and it's there. With something else, you have to really go in and understand how to deal with it. And so that's what I started playing with. Well, what happens if I put this blue next to this blue? Oh, okay. well, what happens if I do them on top of each other? Well, what happens if I do this many blues on top of that? And they're all different blues, but I'm layering them on top of each other. So I have quite an obsession with transparency and veils and layering things onto stuff. So that's where I get a lot of that, like the colors that I, I try, even tried color theory. I was like, oh, I'll try this. And I was like, no, I can get that thing. I want, a, I want like a vibe, like this certain kind of like tone that happens when you see a certain color. And what's funny is a lot of times people don't understand my colors because they don't understand that I'm also Mexican and that a lot of my colors come from a reclamation and an embodiment of what is around me and what I am. And so the colors are coming from very deep conversations that are part of that nonverbal thing. What's interesting about you asking that question is, is I almost died for a long time. I was sick for 10 years, and the last four, I was so sick, I was homebound. And all of the color washed out of my work. I couldn't do it physically, emotionally, spiritually, it was nothing. I was so sick that I turned to ink pens on vintage book pages because they would receive the ink so easily. And so I started doing a lot of the imagery you saw in Jorge's, those of you who were here, his imagery is I started going back to the ancient codices from Mesoamerica and they started talking to me and I would communicate with them and then do these very, and no color, nothing. And that lasted for a number of years, actually. And then coming back into color 
was very challenging. Then I went into charcoals and inks, and then I was like, finally, I got back into colors. Now I'm in full-fledged hyper-color mode again. But it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a journey, and, the, and you're listening to that deeper nonverbal thing where the colors are speaking something, and that, that means sometimes they will change, and they'll go away. So thank you. That was a long answer. <laughs> Hello, thank you for being here. It's so exciting to hear you speak today with us. Oh, and um, I have a couple, just two quick questions. One is, do you um, find the editorial process different now that you have your own press and your creator and editorial? And then also, um, have you ever dabbled in uh, procreate or some kind of a digital medium or is the physical traditional medium really important to you? Okay, thank those you. are good too. Um, all right, so, so, Isabel could probably attest to this. Although you were really intact, like your story was really there before we started playing together with people who don't know what their story is yet. A lot of my work is talking to people. I believe everyone has, everyone has a story. Everyone does have a story, right? And so a lot of times I like to talk to people who don't think they're going to create a book. And or they want to, but they don't know what it is, or they have an idea, but they're not sure. And so it is very much about talking to spirit and, and pulling in those stories and looking at the mythology that already exists all around us in the nature, in spirit, right, and how we are creative. And so I bring stories when I work with people in, in a very different way. It, it's almost like, then we, we craft and we hone and we listen for the song and, you know, how do we tighten it down and everything. I'm going to contrast this with a, I just recently submitted a story to a press I work with, a traditional press I work with. And I, I've had my own press for so long now and create books for so long. I like threw something, I was like, oh, I've got this great, I, this is what I want to do. And it was actually, I feel very excited and important about it. And I gave it to him and the editor wrote back and it's like, well, ch -ch 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 -ch. and what I would say is I've I, would, I was read to filth. I was just like, what was I even thinking? And I had to like go back into my writer brain and the poetry and the song and being like, oh, right, I have to go back to that place for my own self. And so then the second time, it was probably the third or fourth time I had written it, I submitted it and I got the word back, brilliant. I was like, yes, you know, read to filth to brilliant. I was like, this is kind of like the being in that creative space where it's just like, I know, how to take a story and craft it and to listen to it, right? And so that's what I want other people to, to know how to do too. But from that deep, deep spirit place. Um, and then what was the other one was around? About procreate or any kind of oh, dabbling in digital. I've just been having this conversation with my partner because I was like, you know, I could pump out so many books if da 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 da. And we talked a lot about that and and I'm still, I feel like if there is a way that I could, you know, pray into and create some initial piece and then through my own manipulation then create something, I would be open to that. And then I had total ownership over it. But it's, it's there's a, I pray, <laughs> I pray, it's a spiritual thing, right? It's not just I go and I paint, da, 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 da. It's like I pray and I channel and I meditate into the work because I want the kids to be able to connect on the other side. And I hear stories that they do, right? And so we t our conversation was about, do you lose that if you revert to this other thing? And I had to go and I was like, you know, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. As somatically based as I am, the thing that holds us together the most is spirit. And so I was like, there must be a way for creativity, that force of creativity and spirit to connect that if we need to be able to reach kids and this is the way that we can do it, that I can somehow find a way to use those materials. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be limited. And I also want to be effective. And so, you know, that balance all the time. What I do know, though, is that I will never stop painting full children's books. There will always be those, right? Yes. So. Hi, um, I have a question too. Thank you so much for your present. the presence. same place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the same table has a question. <laughs> um, can't wait to buy your new book. It seems absolutely amazing. Um, and I have a question about infinity. Yes. 
Um, so it is very obvious how you represent infinity through the illustrations, and it's, it, it is gorgeous. Um, I have a question about language now, because you're also a writer. How do you represent infinity and possibility uh, also through languages? Did you develop some strategies, and particularly for us people who speak Roman languages in which even trees have a gender? Um, how do you think about the language to open it to infinity? That's good. Y'all are deep. That little strip back there, <laughs> it, it kind of goes dong, dong, dong. Now we're deep, deep. Um, that's really good. So, okay, so I'm going to tell you a secret, so it's not really a secret, is my goal in life is to take over the world through love and children's books. Uh, I think it's doable, right? Uh, and really, I think gender is the way to do that. So I'm going to kind of throw some love basically over to the wheel. Now, I created the wheel, and y'all can touch it later on and play with it, find yourself even. Um, but I really perceived the wheel as a teacher, is, is something that, that I received, in a sense, because I'm in such deep conversation, I think, with nature. And so when I think about infinity and I think about world takeover and how that will function, I often turn to the gender wheel as my teacher because it has a, the full gender wheel actually has a relationship circle, a body circle, uh, gender, what we call the inside circle, and a pronoun circle. And all of the words can be changed to fit any culture, to fit every culture, to fit every species even. Like there's a gender wheel for every body that exists. And so that concept and that this symbol has given me strength to expand how I talk and how I um, and present with people. And so a lot of times I won't know the words, but I know the gender wheel. And so what I hope over time is that communities will also get to know the gender wheel and then help me know how to say the things that need to be said, right? So that there are, because I'm still learning Spanish, I'm still, you know, I speak four languages, three of them, like tiny, tiny, tiny bit. But the, it's not about that, it's about the concepts. It's about that oneness and the, the fact that we are all connected. And so being able to talk about that, we hear that language within, I'm going to guess, most indigenous original spiritual texts. And so as I do my research and want to include everyone across the globe from a non-Western, right, decolonized space, the languages, the stories, the connections, the concepts um, have greater strength than my ability to speak. Does that make sense? So that's what I'm, um, that's, that's my whole world takeover, kind of. <laughs> because, because we're all connected and we're all part of infinity. And the more that we can understand that and see that that's actually a part of nature and that we're all in this beautiful gestalt of like, living and creating, I think that we'll stop taking it out on the planet and stop taking it out on ourselves. So there's that. Anybody else or are we done? Are we close? Is there one more? Do we have yeah. time for one more? Yeah. Sure, we have time, yeah. Because you can tell I'll talk for hours. <laughs> Thank you. That was a beautiful talk, and I thought your your book, the book you read aloud, was really moving. Also, because um, it made me realize that uh, some of the children who really need it may not be getting the book. Um, so I'm I'm wondering about the strategies that you use as a publisher to make sure that your books get um, to reach the children uh, who need them most. Wow. So, like I said, we're a tiny press. It's literally just me and Matthew. And we had one of the most banned books, most banned picture books uh, in the US this last year. It was heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah, except we're so small, it actually takes us down. It doesn't take down the big presses, right? When you're two people and you lose a third of your income, it takes you down. What it taught us, but thank you for the love too. Uh, but what it taught us is that our, our books were getting into schools, right, because of that. 
And uh, so we, that, that's where the heartbreak came from, where we were just like, so there's an a environment of fear that has been so heavily perpetuated that people are, are now terrified to even buy our books and get them into schools. And so we're like, how do we negotiate that? My first thought, I have to be honest, was um, to address it through church, to start going to spiritual venues and being like, you know, we need to have that level of, I want to say normalcy, like societal acceptance, because this is, in my imagination, when people start to understand what the gender wheel approach really is and that it actually unifies all of us, we can start breaking down a lot of those divisions between us because I don't agree with a lot of what the liberals say and I obviously don't agree with a lot of what the conservatives say and I also agree with some of what each of them say and so finding that place where we're no longer divided all the time and we start coming together more so I keep trying to pay attention to what's going to break down those barriers what's going to serve us not today necessarily but over time I'm, I'm can you tell how committed I am to success like I really believe in healing this has changed my body my life my family my community my child how I parent I've had people contact me and say you made me a better parent and I'll be like that is exactly what I need to hear that's my goal is to make us better more relaxed, more belonging, right, people. And so um, I'm gonna start focusing more on um, the nature piece because I feel like that's, I haven't contact, oh, well, I've been really, really busy, but, um, but churches and then nature to find places that are outside of school systems at the moment um, so that we can provide support to the kids who need it because, because it's getting pretty gnarly out there, right? And I live in San Francisco, in the Castro, a historically gay neighborhood, and transphobia reigns often in our neighborhood and in our city. So we got a deal. The, there's uh, uh, da da da. <laughs> so, well, we're an international community. Perhaps we can try to get uh, those books translated as well. <laughs> so we can do our best for that. You know, and that's, I, I so appreciate you saying that too, because our books do have international reach. Like we sell in Europe, we sell in India. Um, I think it's really important in, in that, that's actually my third idea, is to start doing then things that are outside of the US, because at the moment the US is getting even tighter. And so um, this isn't about the US, right? This isn't about the left or liberals. This isn't about even, gender in a way, right? This is about nature. This is about peace. And I don't know if you noticed, peace is peace, death, <laughs> gender. These are the things that I address with my work, right? Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. One more. Here, okay. I so appreciate questions too. I learn every time. Hi, um, I was wondering uh, if you could tell us a little bit about your own journey. When did you start to uh, question the binary of gender? Uh, was it something that maybe someone else told you about or was it something that you started questioning? That's my question. I love this crowd. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been asked that. Um, well, you know, back in the day, I was four when I kissed a girl and knew I was different. Somehow, simultaneously, I knew not to tell anybody. I don't know how I knew that, but I didn't know that. And when I moved to Oregon, to Cottage Grove, Oregon, when I was 13, and I you know, kept it all, and then when I was 13 and I moved there, I made the assumption that everyone was having the same feelings I was having. They just weren't talking about because somehow we all knew not to talk about it. So I'm kind of going along like that, and my mother's white and my father's Mexican, and so they broke down all these barriers in the 60s when you didn't marry brown people, right? Um, white people didn't marry brown people. Brown people didn't marry white people, actually, in his family, I, it was the whole thing. And so I kind of thought that they would be hip and cool, kind of to me being also a breaker, of that sort of thing. and 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 my, my mother stopped talking to me for 10 years. 
and um, family member, he, is she dead? What happened? Da da da. Silence. You know nothing. And I, I think that that when you're left on your own, like at 20, and you you don't have uh, family was everything to me, and so it shocked me into the world, and and the people who took me in because of who I am and because of how I function in the world were, at the time, we didn't have words for trans men, right? But they were trans men in the community. And I was like, oh, I make sense now in this way. I didn't know that I didn't make sense. And, but it took years still, right? So the first partner I was with when I first came out, he didn't transition until Oh, I was in my 30s. So we had we were partnered together in our 20s and I I thought of him as a gay man. I was like, "Oh, this person is a gay man. They look like a butch dyke, but they're not. They're a gay man. That's what we call them right now for whatever reason." And but it was like it became part of my path and just what I understood. And so when I moved to San Francisco when I was 30, and he transitioned, I was a really intimate part of that process and was his main support. He's still one of my best friends. And he was one of the first men to transition during that time. And there's a documentary about it and it was all this big thing. And I was just like, so what's going on here? Like, why did I know back in the day, and he's a gay man, <laughs> I was like, why did I know that? But there was no words, there was no framework, there was no understanding. People weren't even having those conversations. There was one activist at that time in San Francisco that was doing that kind of work, but no one else, right? Like it was literally that rare. And I think what I, happened for me was nature and spirit, right? I say gender is spirit. And so I was just, and then seeing that reflected in nature and all this diversity and the power of that, it calmed me. It allowed me to write, I know the river loves me, right? Where I talk about seeing myself in the river and belonging there. And it's just like, this is, everything is connected. Everything is the same. And the binary, it was so hard to learn how to talk beyond the binary because all of our words have been erased. How many indigenous words did we have before? Countless. Traditions beyond compare. How many exist today? Still some, you would be surprised at how many there still are. But our ability to think in circles, to think in continuums, that everything's connected, that everything's alive. It was spirit that brought me back to myself, to, to the understanding my body already had. And so, you don't, how do you talk about that in the classroom, right? You get out the gender wheel. <laughs> And it's this great symbol that we can talk about and use to take us deeper, right? Because that's where my faith lies. That the, if we just start playing with creativity and scratching the surface of nature and going in and feeling that belonging, literally our minds will open and change and heal. And I'm not alone. I'm just singing my part of the song, right? So, I don't know. There's that. Thanks. And I think that was it. Thank you. And thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you very much, Maya, for sharing your story. As you said, we all have a story. It's something that Ernestina de Soto said yesterday in the Chumash storytelling. So thank you for this conversation. You can follow the conversation in the Multicultural Center at the book signing with Maya. Thank you.